Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of Sunnah Followers Tawheed class. And we have been studying in this class the lawful and the unlawful things in Islam. And we began, we began speaking yesterday about the, the rights of children. We talked about how our children have rights over us as parents. And let's start it off by uh, uh, looking at the quiz to see how well you guys benefited from the knowledge that was presented to you yesterday. Uh, let's look at the first question here. Um, what is the difference between adoption and sponsorship? Because we also uh, spoke yesterday about alternatives that Islam gives us. The alternatives that Allah gives us uh, for those people who cannot have children. Who can tell us what is the difference between adoption and sponsorship? Because sponsorship is an alternative. Who can answer that for us? By the way, just to let the people on Facebook know, Sister Amina Antar, ain't nobody in here in this Zoom room. And you know that what that means. They're going to be sitting there. I'm going to be sitting here talking to myself. Can you join the Zoom room, Amina, so you can answer these questions? Because you know all the answers. No one's in here. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, not, yeah. So I'm going to need some people to answer the questions, Aunt Antar. The difference between... um adoption and sponsorship is um when you're adopting a child you are taking that child as your own and you're giving him your name and making him part of your family and also your inheritance and and sponsorship is when you like send money to a child um which take care of his basic needs without having to like you know give him your um giving him your um inheritance Mashallah, that's a very good description. That's that is, uh oh, excuse me. That is basically the difference. But answer this for me, guys. If I'm going to sponsor a child, can that child live with me? No, he can't. Not at why? Why not? Say, for example, um, I want to be a foster parent a foster, uh, uh, to sponsor a child. We have that that's very popular here in America. And I do know some Muslim women uh, who do this. They sponsor children. Can they do that? Yes, they can sponsor children through the foster system. Well, can they um, live with me? Yes, they can because they're foster children. And more than likely, they're going to be sent out back to their parents or to another uh, source of um, protection after they leave you. Is there, are there any conditions though? For uh, keeping a foster child? The if I were to keeping... have any child, if I were to sponsor any child oh. to live with me as a, I'm a Muslim woman mm -hmm. and I want to sponsor a child, can a child live with me? That's what I really want to know. Yeah, the child can live with you, but if you're sponsoring a child and you are female, it's better to sponsor female children because then they are females and not males. Males are not makram to you. Okay, um, what I'm trying to get you guys to do is explain it. To explain whether or not sponsorship is lawful in Islam. And if it is lawful, are there conditions? And if there are conditions to go into it, I'm trying to teach you guys how to answer questions thoroughly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with sponsoring a child. In fact, the prophet encouraged us to take care of orphans. However, there are some conditions we need to consider. 
as Muslims when it comes to sponsoring children. If you are a Muslim woman and you are single, if you are a Muslim woman, woman and you are single, it would be better for you to sponsor female children. So that way you don't have to worry about mahram because when children reach the age of puberty and children are reached the age of puberty at 10 years old, when you're taking in a child that's over the age of 10, that child is most likely puberty. You cannot be alone with a non-mahram. Everybody understand that. What about this? What if I were married? I, I'm a woman and I have a husband and I want to sponsor children. Can I do that then? Are there conditions or whatever? Who can explain that? If you are married, you and your husband both have to agree to the sponsorship. What does that have to do with anything? We're talking about sponsoring. I would say the man, of course, the man agrees. Are there any conditions? If I am a married couple, if a married couple decides to sponsor a child, are there guidelines or conditions in Islam that has to be abided to? I want y'all to start thinking like Muslims and answering questions like Muslims. Think of everything that you've learned about Islam. The rules, the laws, the lawful, the unlawful. And now tell me, if I am a Muslim couple, if a Muslim couple wants to sponsor children, what are some of the laws, rules, guidelines that our Lord puts in effect for us? Okay. Uh, the child cannot be referred to as yours, as his husband and wife. Uh, you're not parents because there's no blood relations to that child. Also, the child is not a makram, male or female. If it's a female, it's not a makram to the husband. So the child must be covered. If it's a male, then the woman must be covered and treat that child as a non makram um, That's all. How is that possible mm -hmm. in America? Can it, um, let me see who's here on Facebook. Can some of you guys in Facebook come in here and answer this? May Leon, can you tell me if a Muslim couple here in America wanted to sponsor children, what are some guidelines that they should keep in mind? Guidelines as in, in the home? Excuse me, say it again. I said guidelines as in like certain rules and regulations a person should follow like within the home when they're bringing someone into their home yeah go let me yeah explain it islamically um, say i am a non-muslim and i'm asking you Xmailion, do yours does your religion allow y'all to sponsor since y'all got such strict rules what are some what are the guidelines you women and men would have to abide by if you were sponsoring children I would say like sponsorship is like lawful with conditions. Um, you have to keep in mind that that child, like Sister Anissa said that you're not blood related. Then there's like certain like guidelines to follow. You should be covered if you're sponsoring like a, a young boy, you let him know that you're not his mom or nothing. You're just a person who's taking, you're taken care of. And you also like set boundaries with your kids. If you have female daughters, you try to separate the kids away from each other or you know, give the child a room that's away from all the other kids, but you don't make them feel like an outcast, but just making sure that you set, you know, boundaries. That's what I would tell someone. That's the intelligent way to answer. You guys see the difference in how she answered and how Anissa and the other people did. You guys want to be able to answer intelligently. You want to make the religion sound intelligent. You want to make the religion seem, uh, appear the way it is, easy. You don't just sit there and say, well, you know, you know, you know, we got to be covered. The people are going to say, what the hell do you mean you got to be covered? What are you talking about? What are you going to do? I want you guys to learn how to answer questions intelligently. Okay. Yes, we can sponsor children. But if you're going to be a, a, a couple that wants to sponsor, you should first start off with preparing your home. This is the way Layla Nasheba would answer. If someone came to me or if someone came to Sheikh Morsi or Dr. Asim 
and asked us, oh, Dr. Assam, because Dr. Assam answers these type of questions all the time. Dr. Assam, what, do, what, what are alternatives for Muslims who can't have children? And he would tell them, well, we, are, we can sponsor. You know, Islam is all about sponsorship. You know, there's nothing, you know, this is something that Islam encourages. But before a couple would even embark upon this, they would first do what? Prepare their home. And how would we prepare our home? We'd make sure that we have accommodations for those children that are separate, but not excluded. You see how I'm answering, Anissa? Y'all see how I'm answering intelligently? You know, I would make sure that I, for example, have an attic or a basement in my home that I could uh, fix it up like an apartment. Because in Islam, you're right, uh, non-Muslim man. You're right, they're gonna tell you, y'all can't be with people that ain't Mahrams. They know, the Kafirs know our religion better than we do. And you would tell them, yes, you're correct. You, what you're saying is correct. You know, we can't have our daughters and sons mixing with children, you know, that are not their blood. So what we do is prepare our home. You know, we would make sure our attic or our basement, you know, is set up appropriately like an apartment where the child can be separate from our children, but not excluded. Okay. So that way, you know, if my husband is home, I can go with the, 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 the if it's a girl that I'm sponsoring, she has her place in the basement where she doesn't have to be around my husband or my boys. And my daughters can go and interact with her. See, I want you guys to break stuff down. When I ask y'all questions like this, don't just ramble off crap, explain it. Because people think that we're crazy anyway. They think that our religion is extreme and fanatical and, and you have to be able to explain it. So if it's a couple, make sure that your home is prepared where the child can be separate from you and yours, but not excluded. And understand that you would never leave that child in a house alone with your husband, if it's a girl or with yourself. If it's a boy, you're simply providing food, shelter, clothing, and maintenance for that child. But you want to set the boundaries. So for that child's protection, because that child doesn't belong to you, it doesn't belong to your husband, it doesn't belong to your children. And you know what that means? That means things happen. People like to experiment. So set the boundaries Islamically. And I'm gonna tell you one of the questions that a sister sent me, she said, what did the companions do? Well, let me tell you how the companions sponsored. If a family took in a young girl, when that girl reached puberty, they would either marry that girl to one of their sons or the man would marry her himself. Just like what happened with the prophet Muhammad, he took in Ali. Ali was his cousin. The prophet took in Ali to help care for him, but the prophet had a daughter living with him. Her name was Fatima. So when Ali reached the age of puberty and Fatima reached the age of puberty, so there wouldn't be any hanky panky and, and on their stanky, the prophet married them. That's how the companions would do. If they were taking a, a young slave boy, you know, adopt or not adopt, because adoption is haram, but if they would sponsor a young slave boy, they would have him live with them. But when puberty come, he would either be married to one of their daughters, okay, or something like that. If it was a girl, either she'd be married to one of the sons or to the father would marry her himself. That's how the companions did, but we don't do that nowadays, of course, not here in America. So if you're going to sponsor children, first make sure you have the proper accommodations. So if that child is of the opposite sex, it can be separate from you and yours. 
Does everybody understand? That's the type of explanation I'm looking for. Okay. Otherwise, just send money. Otherwise, you can just send money to the child, wherever the child is living. Everybody understand that? All right, let's move on to the next question. True or false, a child sponsored by you becomes automatically a mahram to you. Is that statement true or false? False. That is false. false. Okay. Why is it false? Because there's no blood relations to you from that child, not at all. And because there's no blood relations to you, that child can never become a Makaram to you. Okay, so I want you guys to understand that because there are some Muslims today who are so misguided that they believe that they can sponsor children and those children become part of their families. They're not part of your families. Okay, so be careful with that. That's why we have to have the separate accommodations for them. Okay, let's look at the next question. Is artificial insemination lawful in Islam? And if so, what are the guidelines? Yes, artificial insemination is um, lawful in Islam as long as the egg is yours and your husband at that time. Everybody agree with what she's saying? Yes. Yes, it has to be the husband's sperm and his wife's egg. What about this? Say me, uh, me and my husband got divorced, but I do. We, but can I still use his sperm? No, no that is because we're no longer together. Because that would be adultery, terrible. That's okay, so the condition is that you have to be married. Number one. And it has to be your your egg and the husband's sperm. What about this? Can I use the egg of, of a co-wife? I must say my husband has another wife. Can I use her egg? No, ma'am, no. you cannot use her uh -huh. egg. Okay, it has to be your egg and your husband's sperm. And you have to be married at the time of doing it. Everybody understand that? Those are the guidelines for artificial insemination. What about this? Abdul has two wives. One wife cannot carry a child in her womb. So another wife, the other wife volunteers to, to carry the child for them. Is this permissible? Why or why not? This is not permissible because at this point in time, she becomes a surrogate mother too, and her blood would be mixed with the baby's blood. And so as now it's it's three mixed and not just two. And what is that? And what does that fall under in Islam? What is that called in Islam? What sin is adultery. that? Adultery. This is adultery. This is Zena. This is illegal, illegal sexual relations. There is no surrogacy in Islam. I know a lot of you like to watch 90 Day Fiance and all that stuff. And you see this ignorant woman on 90 Day Fiance, you know, talking about how, you know, she wants her daughter to, to carry a baby for her. She want to take her egg and her husband's sperm, mix them together and put it in her daughter. Can my daughter do that for me? No. No, this is haram because this is still, this is filth. This is adultery. This is, this is Zena. Everybody understand that? So there's no surrogacy in Islam. We don't do that. I don't care if it's a co-wife. I don't care if it's your daughter, your mama, your grandmother. We can't do that. This is haram. Okay. And let's look at the last question. We spoke about the rights that our children have over us. What rights do children have over their parents? Anyone? The rights they have over their um, parents is to be fed, clothed, and protected, given a good name, and treated equally between their siblings. As the prophet said that um, 
each person is a caretaker and they are responsible under those under his care. What does she forget? The inheritance she to exist. Okay, somebody get on the mic and name all the rights. What are the, all the rights that children have over their parents? They have the right to exist. They That's have the, the, okay, right. the first right. The first right is the right to exist. Norto, don't forget that. If the child was conceived, it has the right to exist. What does that mean? You I can't mean, have not, an abortion and you can't kill the baby. Exactly. We can't kill it. You can't abort it and you can't kill it. That's the first right that the children have over you. And what's the second right? They have the right to a good name. They have a good name. Exactly. You have to name your children a good name. Don't give your kid a bad name. Don't call your child demon. Don't name your child Lucifer, demon, idiot, or stuff like that. Vagina. I know a girl in high school named Vagina. I'm like, who would name their child Vagina? Either she was embarrassed when they would call her name in school. You have to give your children a good name. What's the third right? To be cared for. Exactly. The third right is to be cared for, to be taken care of. It's your job to provide food, clothing, shelter, and medical care to that child. And then what's the next right? The right to education. Yeah, that's part of being cared for. Exactly. That's equality. Huh? The right to be treated to be treated equally. Yeah, what does that mean when we say treat our children equally? What does that mean? Your son and your daughter should be treated as the same. No, no gift to her if you won't give a gift to him. No so in favoritism. Other words, no favoritism. In other words, no favoritism. You might have a favorite child, but you shouldn't show it. You shouldn't show it openly. You may have, most parents do have favorite children, just like grandparents have favorite grandkids, but we shouldn't show it, okay? You have to treat them all with justice and fairness. If you're gonna buy a present for one, buy for all of them. It doesn't have to be the same gift, but it should be something that that child would have liked to have too. And any other rights? Inheritance. Yes, and also the right of inheritance. You cannot cut your child out of inheritance because you're angry at him or you're angry with her. Does everyone understand? So those are the rights that our children have over us. And this, these are the things that we discussed yesterday. And again, just like when we talked about marriage, Islam is a check and balance. Just as children have rights over their parents, the parents have rights over the children. And today we're gonna speak about the rights that the parents have over children. Are there any questions about any of these answers we gave before we start the lecture? Any questions before I begin the lecture? Because the parents have rights too. And you see today that those rights are being abused, just like people, the uh, children's rights are not being implemented. Parent Parental rights are not being implemented today either. So we're gonna speak about the parental rights of the parents, okay? And again, I do wanna emphasize this fact because there's a lot of questions about it. Uh, emails, oh, I don't know, wait a minute. I need to go back. There's a lot of emails that I received uh, about this uh, come to, I, I'm, I'm just really shocked to know that Muslims are behaving, I shouldn't be shocked though, they're behaving like cappers, getting angry, uh, cutting people out of the wheel. In Islam, it is forbidden for a parent to get angry at a child and remove him. If your parents are Muslim and you are Muslim, they cannot remove you from the wheel. And I want you parents to understand that Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, your fathers or your sons, you do not know which of them is closer to you and benefit. This is an obligation ordained by Allah. 
Here are laws telling us that, you know, we can't do this. He says, which is not injurious. A charge from a law and a law is knowing and patient. Those are the limits of a law and whoever obeys a law and his messenger, he will admit into the paradise. But though whoever disobeys the law and his messenger and transgress his limits, he will admit him to the hellfire. Allah has set the guidelines in the Quran in Surat al-Baqarah as to how our property is supposed to be divided up. We can't change that. But there are a couple of things I do want to speak about today that I didn't mention yesterday based on, uh, let me look at this, the emails I got uh, yesterday. I want you guys to know just as a non-Muslim cannot be a guardian over a Muslim, non-Muslims do not inherit from us either. And we cannot inherit from them. I, I repeat, non-Muslims do not inherit from us and we do not inherit from them. What does that mean? If your mother and your father are not Muslims, if they die, you have no rights to their inheritance. If you are Muslim, but your children are not Muslim, I don't mean they don't practice. I mean, your children are not Muslims. They never testify to la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, or they deny it. Then that means they don't inherit from you. Does everyone understand? These are the laws that Allah set for us. However, as we talked about yesterday, Allah out of his mercy allows us to gift up to one third of our estate to whoever or whatever we want. So say, for example, you converted to Islam. None of your children are Muslim. You have no brothers, no sisters. None of your relatives are Muslim. So what happens to your money? You can gift one third of your estate to your non-Muslim children or whoever you want. Does everybody understand? Or you can do the second alternative. Make sure you give them everything before you die. Those are your options. Before you die, make sure you got it where the house is gonna go to them or whatever. You, you're giving the house to them and divide it up before you die. Sell the house, you know, and divide the money up before you die, okay? And the same if your parents are Muslim, because I have a lot of converts who come from wealthy families and they don't understand that they are no longer under the uh, uh, can, are inheritors of their parents. But what you can do is let your parents know that they can leave you up to one third of whatever they have or they can give it to you while they live. So if daddy is a rolling stone and wherever he lays his hat is his home, tell him before you die, make sure you give me 30 grand. Whatever you want me to have after you die, I can't get because I'm Muslim. So give it to me now while you lay in your hat. Give me my 50 grand now. You can do that. Everybody understands, but so those are the two alternatives, but I just have to let you know, we are not inheritors of the non-believers and they are not inheritors of us. So whatever children y'all got that are not Muslim and you want them to take from you, you better give it to them now, or you can gift one third to them. Where does the rest go? To the Muslims to the masjid, okay? Any questions on that? And I hope I answered, uh, let me look on Facebook. I hope I answered the sister's question. Did I answer your question on Facebook? Mashallah, okay, good. Thank you, yeah, she said, thank you for breaking it down. She said, she, yeah, she said she'll just, um, yes, you can do that. You can sell the house, she has a house. That's what her thing was. Yes, yeah, sister, you can sell the home now. If you know you want to downsize, she said that she wants to downsize 
downsize and get you a nice condominium like I live in. I live in a beautiful condo. Okay, downsize, sell that big, big home you got and, and, and now and just give the money to your kids. Divide it up now with them. So that way when you die, it won't be no fighting because they don't inherit from you anyway. Yeah, you're welcome. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so that's the first point that I wanted to make about that inheritance. Okay. And so now, oh, also Allah says this in the interpretation of meaning, Allah makes clear to you his law so that you do not make mistakes. And Allah has knowledge of all things. Allah knows what's best for us, guys. He makes these laws for our betterment. He knows his creation better than we know ourselves. Don't question why he said the Kaffirs can't inherit. You know, they just can't because he knows what's best. And again, whoever disobeys the law's laws of inheritance has deviated from the, the straight path and they have transgressed the limits of a law. And you can expect that a law will punish you. A law promises when it comes to inheritance, any Muslims that violate the laws of inheritance, Allah has promised he will punish you. Listen to what he says in the interpretation of the meaning, the hellfire to live there, and it will be a humiliating punishment. So y'all better adhere to, those law, to the, uh, the, the laws of inheritance. Okay, don't violate them. Don't cut your children out and don't add Kaffir children to it. Everybody understand that? Okay, so now what we're going to do since I answered that question, let's move on to the rights that the parents have. Because again, Allah is merciful. He gave children rights over us and we have rights over them. And it is the right of the parent that their children show kindness, obedience, and honor to them. And this is something that we see disappearing today. You guys witness it even here with me in my home with my little granddaughter. This is, these are the signs of the times. Kids talk back. Kids are disobedient. Kids are disrespectful. You know, the prophet said each generation will become worse than the one before it. The children today are so horrific. They have no respect. They don't have the respect that we had. When we were growing up, you talk back to your mother, she punch you. Nowadays, if you try to punch a kid, they gonna call the police on you. They go 911 you and you gonna be in jail as a terrorist. You know, these are the times. And it shows how uh, uh, we're in the last days because the prophet said one of the signs of the last hour will be that children will show no respect for their parents. So this is one of our rights that our children treat us with respect, honor, and kindness, especially the mother. And I want you guys to know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the mother, the mother is, uh, uh, the mother, I mean, the grandmother and the aunt are just like the mother. You're supposed to reverence the womb that bore you. And that means reversing the womb that bore her and the womb that bore her and so forth and so on. To disrespect your grandmother, to disrespect your auntie, it's the same as disrespecting your mother. And unfortunately, children are doing that today. Okay? Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning and we have enjoined on man kindness to his parents. His mother carries him, carried him in pain and she gave birth to him in pain. And the period of carrying him and weaning him is 30 months. You know, you are lost emphasizes how we should have more respect for the mother than even the father. Because he helped, you know, in your existence, but she's the one that carried you in her stomach and went through a lot of pain bringing you in this world. And she's the one that fed you and cared for you until you were two years old and able to, to stand up on your own. SubhanAllah, and eat regular food. 
So Islam really uh, specifies uh, the good kindness towards mothers. Also, we have a hadith, whereas once a man came to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked, who is most deserving of my companionship? The prophet said, your mother. And the man said, who after her? He said, your mother. Who next? He said, your mother. Who next? Your mother. And then your father. And I'm going to give you the history of this hadith. What happened was this man came to the prophet complaining because he had just gotten married. And his wife was jealous of his relationship with his mother. And his mother was jealous of his relationship with the wife. The mother wanted him to spend more time with her. The wife wanted him to spend his time with her. So the prophet went to the, I mean, the man went to the prophet and said, oh, prophet of Allah, I'm being pulled two different ways. Who is, is most deserving of my time? Should I spend it with my mom, my, my, my wife? The prophet said, your mother. And after your mother, your father. So you learn from this hadith that even when it comes to the time, the father has rights over the wife too. The wife is most deserving of your money. Your money. Because she is now under your care. She and your children are your immediate responsibility. So in regards to the man's money, the wife is most deserving. But in regards to the time, it's the mother and the father. So say, for example, your mother and your father needs you to come over and help them fix the garage. Say your father calls you and says, hey, the son, I need the garage to be fixed. Can you come help me? And you say, well, my wife wants me to take her out to dinner. You have to tell your wife, sorry, honey, cancel the plans. We'll go out to dinner some other time. In fact, here's $100. Go out and buy some dinner for yourself because I got to go over and help pops. Pops comes first in regards to time, time, time. You guys understand? So the man can give his wife $50 and say, go buy yourself a good dinner. You know, I'm going to go over and help pops. Or say your mother calls and says, honey, son, I need you to come help me clean the basement. Your wife wants you to take her shopping and take her to the movies. You tell her, I'm sorry, sweetheart, here's some money. You can go to the movies on your own, but I'm going to help my mom clean the basement. So when it comes to the man's time, his parents are more deserving. But the paycheck, that don't go to your mom and dad. The paycheck goes to your wife. And if you, if your wife is like most women, see how Allah knows his creation? Most women will take the $50 and say, have a good time. Bye-bye. Because you know, a woman is satisfied with the money so she can go shopping. Women love to shop and make themselves beautiful. So if she's a true good woman, she'll take the money and say, have a good time with your mom and dad. Give them my slimes. Better you than me, Aki. And keep it moving. Okay. See how Allah knows his creation. Okay. So the parents are most deserving of your time and your respect. That's what the child owes the parents. And also another right that the parents have is the right to obedience. As long as they're not telling you to do something that contradicts what Allah says. Now, I got to specify this because I was surprised, uh, to hear from Brother Haytham. Remember when Brother Haytham told us that he knows a lot of Muslim men who marry convert women. And when they marry these convert women on the wedding night, the convert woman looks at him and says, shave your beard because I don't like a beard. It, it's not comfortable and I'm not used to this. And then the, the silly, ignorant man goes and shaves his beard because he feels that if he doesn't shave the beard, he'll lose his wife. This is a wimp in Islam and a sissy. It's what we call in America a sissy because men were created to lead 
not to be fo not not to follow. And that's a man that was just looking for an excuse to shave anyway. Just like no man is supposed to obey his wife. I don't know one who obeys him anyway, but just like you cannot obey your wife over a law, okay? You don't obey your parents over a law either. If your parents tell you to shave your beard, that's when you look at them and say, I love you, but I'm not shaving my beard because this is an obligation imposed upon me by my Lord. And I don't love anyone more than him. Just like you should have told your, 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 your mentally ill wife when she told you on your wedding night to shave your beard, you should have looked at her and said, the beard stays because my Lord commands it, but you can hop up and, and, and bounce. Okay. I've never heard anything like that. I don't know men that obey their wives. And it, what it, the world is a, is a strange place. Okay. So you obey your parents as long as they're not telling you to do something haram, just as we obey our husbands and our wives for the little sussies out there. You obey your wives as long as they're not telling you to do something haram. Um, listen to what um, the prophet uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said, shall I not tell you about the three major sins, the worst sins anyone can commit? He said, to associate partners with Allah and to disobey your parents. And, and, and then he set up and said also to tell lies and give false testimony. These are the worst sins we can commit. So unless your parents tell you to do something like shave your beard or take off your hijab, or don't pray, you have to obey them. Everybody understand that? Your parents tell you that they don't want you leaving the house. You can't leave the house if you live with them, okay? Your parents tell you don't open that door for no one when I'm not home. You obey them. You don't open that door for no one when they're not home. Your parents tell you they want you to wash the dishes every night and take the garbage out. You obey them. You wash the dishes every night, take the garbage out, whether you like it or not. To disobey them, you know, and they're not telling you something that's haram is a major sin. Also, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said there are three groups of people who will never enter paradise. And one is a person who diso was disobedient to his parents. Another is a pimp. You hear that, brothers? And another is the woman who imitates men. So you sisters going around telling men to shave uh, their beards because you trying to be uh, the stud in the relationship, you know, ponder that. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah will defer the punishment of all sins until the day of judgment, except for those who disobey their parents. For those who disobey their parents, Allah will punish them in this life before they die. So a lot of people say, oh, Sister Layla, my life is so bad, so twisted. How do you treat your parents? That's the one punishment that Allah is not going to delay. This is something I have to tell my granddaughter too. I tell her all the time because she's got a smart mouth. You guys hear my granddaughter all the time. Okay. I tell her, you know, you talk smart to me. You talk smart to your mother too. I say, you better realize, little girl, nothing's going to work for you in this world until you learn to respect your mama and your grandma and your great grandma and your aunts. Okay? Because, you know, you th you, you're going to want life to go so nice for you. But when I die, when your mother die and your great grandmother die, you're going to have it hard, sweetheart. And you're going to think back to how you used to talk to me, how you used to talk to your mother, how you used to treat other people because you were selfish and, 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 and felt privileged. And you will regret it. But it'll be too late to go back. And it's something that we need to tell all our children. 
Because I, like I say, the youth today are so disrespectful. I was at the grocery store the other day with my disrespectful granddaughter and there was another Muslim family there. The little kid was screaming and hollering and kicking because the mother wouldn't give him what he wanted. And then he said, oh, I'm done with you. I hate you. I said, listen to him. I hate you. You know, kids are disrespectful these days. And she's sitting there and her husband embarrassed. They should have whooped his butt. But then again, you can't because if they had to whoop their, his butt, somebody in the store would have called 911, especially since she's hijab like me. And, you know, we, we Muslims, you know, we terrorists. So it puts us in a bad situation here, you know, but try to explain to your children when you disrespect us, when you be, are disobedient to us, it's going to come back and hit you when you older and we're gone. You're going to wish you could go back, you know, and make amends. I remember with myself, I was, I wasn't as bad as my granddaughter, but I was disrespectful too, to my stepfather. I used to treat my stepfather so bad. I had a wicked mouth, a wicked tongue like she has. And I remember when I grew up and got older though, at least I realized it before he died. And it, I said, oh my God, I treated him so bad when he raised me up the best way that any man could raise a daughter that wasn't his own blood. He gave me whatever I needed. He's the one that taught me the Dean. I learned to slime not from my real father, but from him. And I remember when I was years late, when I was in my 20s, I, I apologized. I told him, I said, forgive me for all the disrespect I gave you as a child. You know, at least I was able to apologize and make it up. But how many children today will have that chance? Something that we need to tell our kids, okay? So again, this is one of the rights that the parents have you know, is to be obeyed, to be obeyed, to be respected. Also, treat them kindly, especially when they get old. Because as a person gets old, it, the person loses himself. And this is something that I have to, again, remind myself of. Because my mother, my mother raised me, and my, but my mother is getting old. And sometimes, you know, her mind becomes weak and feeble, and I don't have the patience for her. So rather than disrespect her, I'll call somebody else and say, oh, somebody help my mother, because I just, I don't want to make her feel like she's, like she's crazy or something. But, you know, it's hard. I'm telling you, and I'm the same way too, because I'm up in age too now, and I'm becoming more anxious. I, and I see it with my granddaughter. I tell her the same way that I have to lower my wing to my mother and accept the fact that she's old. You need to lower your wing to me and accept the fact that I suffer with anxiety. I said, and be more patient with me. So I'll look at and have to catch myself with how I talk to my own mother. Because sometimes I'm like, what are you talking about, mom? What are you saying? You know, so Allah tells us to be even more uh, kind towards our parents when they get old. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. Your Lord has decreed that you worship no one but him and that you be kind to your parents. If one or both of them reach old age, old age do not say words of annoyance to them or hate them, but instead speak to them in a gr with gracious words and lower your wing to them. That means show mercy to them because they showed mercy to you when you were little. And I have to catch myself too because my mother was always there for me. My mother is the one that instilled self-respect, self-love in me. If it wasn't for my mother, I'd be one of these broken, weak women that we see running around here all the time but I'm strong and I'm res resolute and resilient because of my mother, she instilled that in me. If I was being oppressed in school, she dressed in her, put on her black, she put on her black hijab and a baya and put her gun on her hip and she'd walk them to that school and say, who's messing with my daughter? She's Muslim. You're going to respect her. My mother didn't care if you was, it was a man. She'd jump in their face and tell them you are not 
going to oppress my Muslim daughter or me. And she have her hand on her hip where her little gun was. You know, so, you know, I think about that. When I find myself losing patience with my mother, I think about that, how she was there for me. I think about how when my brother, I have my middle, I have four brothers. When my middle brother was graduating with his degree in marketing, they wanted to hold him back because the school he was going to was very racist because he was not a white American. He was one of the, the, the minorities getting ready to graduate with a, one of the best degrees. And they told him he couldn't graduate because of one class. I'll never forget my mother put on all her black, he jabbed to the ground, little pistol on her hip, went to that college and told them, you are not gonna do to my son what y'all did to Malcolm X. The man looked, she, the dean looked at her she said, y'all are not going to do to my son what y'all did to Malcolm X. And she told him, you're going to give him that degree or we going to rain hell on this school. She said, I'll call all the Muslims in the state of Ohio. She said, and we will rain hell on this university. My brother graduated with his degree in international marketing. So I think about stuff like that, how my mother and her youth was always there for her children to protect them. So now that she's old and feeble and her mind wanders, because, you know, sometimes I have to make myself have patience. Because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be the strong Muslim Daya that I am today. Okay, so again, guys, Allah tells us in this Quran, keep in the Quran, keep patience. Show patience with them in old age. And remember, remember how they cherished us when we were little. Remember how our parents protected us when we were little, how our parents sacrificed for us. And that'll humble you and, and, and humble you more towards them. And also another right that the parents have over the child is the right to not be cursed. And a lot of people may ask, how do you curse your parents? Well, when you curse somebody else's parents, you get mad at me and you say, your mama. And I get mad at you and say, your daddy. You say, your grandmama. And I say, yo, your granddaddy. That's cursing because you're cursing somebody else's parents. In turn, that person is going to retaliate and curse yours. This is a sin. Don't go around cursing other people's parents. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, amongst the major sins is for a man to curse his parents. And the people said, how is it possible that a man would curse his own parents? The Prophet said, by insulting another man's father and insulting another man's mother. That's going to cause them to insult yours. So thus you have cursed them. So teach your children, don't play the dirty dozen. Don't talk about other people's parents because everybody loves their mama. Everybody loves their daddy. Everybody loves their grandmother. So don't, when you get mad at people, don't play the dirty dozen because all it's going to do is come back on you and yours. And this is a right that we have to, uh, the parents have to not be cursed. So thus you can see guys, pleasing our parents is very important in Islam. And to show how important a parent is, a man cannot even volunteer to go fight in a war without his parents' permission. We have the hadith where a man came to the prophet and, and said, oh, prophet of Allah, I want to go out and fight with you against the Quraysh. The prophet asked him, are your parents living? He said, yes. The prophet said, then go back and help them. Then we have another hadith where another man came to the prophet and said, oh, prophet of Allah, I, I want to give allegiance to you. I want to migrate and be with you. In fact, I left my parents, even though they didn't want me to leave, the prophet said, go back to them and make them happy. 
So the prophet wouldn't even accept this man's migration because his parents were unhappy and needed him to take care of them. And then there's another hadith where a man from Yemen migrated to Medina because he wanted to be with the prophet. And the prophet asked him, do you have any family back in Yemen? He said, yes, my parents are there. The prophet said, did your parents give you permission to come here to be with me? The man went and said, no. The prophet said, then go back and ask for their permission. If they agree to it, then come here with me. And then you can fight with me. Otherwise, stay at home and service them. So again, how many children do we have nowadays? We read about it on the news. They leave their homes and they call themselves going to do jihad. And their parents beg them not to do this. Do you think they're doing jihad? No. The parents have rights over you. You're taking care of your parents, doing like Brother Ahmad. Look at Brother Ahmad here of my website. Brother Ahmad, he grew up here on my website. He's single, but he's a handsome man. He's highly educated. But he chooses to stay alone because he takes care of his father. He takes care of his mother and he takes took care of his grandmother and his sister. He's getting more reward taking care of them because they're sickly and they need him than going out fighting in any other type of way. Again, guys, this is how it is. The parents have rights over us. So many children today don't understand that. You read in newspapers, young girls going to Syria, thinking they're doing jihad, they end up in a situation they can't get out of. Young men leaving their parents and leaving their family, you know, to go join somebody else's cause. This is not a slap. You see the prophet sent these young men back home and told them, go take care of your families. He would always ask them, do, do you have parents? Do your parents need you at home with them? If your parents need you, go do like Brother Ahmad. Take care of your father. Take care of your mom and your grandparents. And I want you guys to know all these rights, they're not just limited to Muslim parents. These rights are for all parents, whether they're Muslim or not. Allah says, and the interpretation of the meaning, be grateful to me and to your parents and to me is the final goal. But if they strive to compel you to associate partners with me, then do not obey them, but keep relations with them in this life in a kind manner and follow the way of those who return, who turn to me. So here Allah is telling us in this verse, you know, to be kind to your parents. It doesn't matter if they're Muslim or not. As long as they are not trying to get you to associate partners with Allah, as long as they are not trying to get you to compromise your Allah. Does everybody understand that? Because some Muslims think that because their parents are not Muslim, they can treat them with disrespect. No, only if they are enemies to you, only if they are fighting against you, only if they're trying to get you to leave this religion, do we back away from them and not deal with them. But if your parents are non-Muslims and they're kind, they're not standing in the way of you and your relationship with Allah, then you still show compassion for them. You still take care of them. If your wife wants to go to the show, the movies, and your mother needs you to come clean out the basement, you tell wifey, boo, here's $10, go watch Netflix or whatever. I'm going to help mom. Whether that mom is Muslim or not. So thus, guys, we see the check and the balance that Islam has. Children have rights over us. We have rights over them. Husbands have white rights over the wife. The wife has rights over them. The imam has rights over the people. The people have rights over them. Everything in Islam is balanced. Islam is a beautiful way of life. And what makes our way of life different than any other way is 
it's balanced. It is justly balanced. So we're going to stop right here for today. I want you guys to think about these rights. I want you to consider as parents, are you giving your children their rights? And I want you children to consider tonight, are you giving your parents theirs too? If you realize that you're not honoring the rights that a law has imposed upon the parents, you better change. Just like if you are not honoring the rights that a law has imposed upon you for your children, you better change. Because death can come at any moment. All right. So we'll stop right here. Supana kalahuma wabiham.